Anxiety has a gospel, and the gospel is worry your way to peace. Just keep worrying about it. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Mike Cosper, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Nicole Martin. This week, we're going to talk about how AI is changing work, making some people anxious about their futures. Steve Cuss will join us for that. Then we'll talk with Robert Nicholson about the death of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny. And finally, Esau McCauley will join us to talk about why Black History Month still matters. So stay with us. Hey, Nicole, welcome back. Welcome. It's good to see you. We missed last week. I got sick at the last minute, and so we just had to sort of bail on the thing. I was glad I I called you, and you were like, Mike, we're not doing a show this week. Go to bed. Prioritize your health. Prioritize. (laughs) Stay alive. Hashtag stay alive. (laughs) I'm glad I made it through. We got a good lineup this week. So recent research from Ernst & Young shows that 90% of workers are using some form of AI at work. 71% are concerned about it. 48% say they're more concerned today than a year ago, and 41% say it's evolving too quickly. A couple of interesting things that came out from this Ernst & Young report. One was Gen Z is actually less likely to use AI at work, and they don't believe that the technology will make their work more efficient. Older generations worry about its security, where Gen Z is suspicious about its effectiveness. They also said employees overwhelmingly have concerns that AI will hurt their financial well-being and professional growth, including negatively affecting their salary, losing out on promotions for not knowing how to use it, or falling behind if they don't learn the technology. And that's all like 72%, 67%, 66%. So joining us for a conversation about this is Steve Cuss. He's the host of Being Human, a CT Media podcast. He's also the author of Managing Leadership Anxiety and the founder of Capable Life, a ministry that helps people address internal and relational anxieties. Steve Cuss, welcome to The Bulletin. Yeah, Mike and Nicole, great to be with you guys. What a fun, fun conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, maybe we'll start here then. Speaking broadly... Why are people anxious at work? And how do you think about AI's effect on that? And is AI going to make us more anxious? Should it make us Mm. more anxious? I think as a general rule, people are anxious at work because of relationships and deadlines. That would be just a very simple, like, why are people anxious at work? Usually the boss, (laughs) or usually because one staff member has more power and gets their way. People are anxious at work because workplace culture violates the values of the organization that are on the wall. That's like, in a nutshell, people generally leave managers rather than job descriptions. As it relates to AI, that's such a fascinating conversation. I I think people are anxious because anytime something is ambiguous, it makes you anxious. If you're ever at a dinner party and someone begins a political rant full of generalizations, like that's guaranteed the whole dinner party is going to get anxious, which doesn't mean they're going to get worried. It means they're going to get reactive. So as it relates to AI, one of the sources of anxiety is always ambiguity. So I've dabbled in AI. I heard it described once as like having a really good middle school or high school aged assistant. I find that to be a pretty accurate, like on the one hand, man, it found something pretty fascinating. On the other hand, wildly unreliable. What goes through my mind is, will it really take over jobs? It will certainly take over some jobs, but it's also going to generate as many or more jobs I just think as artificial intelligence becomes more helpful, we need more human interaction more and more. So for me, people are anxious about AI. Usually what anxiety does, obviously this is my field is the dynamics of anxiety, is it wants to keep things vague. It also, it wants you to stay on a treadmill to nowhere. So anxiety has a gospel and the gospel Mm. is worry your way to peace. Just keep worrying (laughs) about it. Man, and so good. I always encourage people to do something. So if people are worried about AI, they should really try it and look into it and get from that ambiguity to clarity. Clarity is a great anxiety reliever. I think a lot of people are going to discover that it's not going to take their jobs, that it will create more jobs. It's like any technology, right? I'm thinking back to the movie Hidden Figures when the people were called computers and then they brought in machines called computers. And one of the ladies saw the writing on the wall and she's like, well, I better learn how to run this thing and made herself essential. So I confess to not being too worried about it because I think our world is so desperate for quality human interaction. Yeah, you just think about, I'm always looking for a good mechanic, a good handy person around the house. And honestly, they're hard to come by. So I think more and more 
there's going to be a rise of blue collar work and good craftsmanship, stuff like that. Yeah, I've thought about it. There's kind of two tracks for the conversation because it's in many ways, it's a conversation about work. And on the one hand, work is the labor you have to do to provide, right? Like, Mm -hmm. how am I going to pay my bills and all of that? And there's a certain kind of anxiety that that comes around that. And I think what you just said speaks to that. Well, there's always going to be work around AI. And in fact, it's going to change the marketplace, but it's going to generate work. The other side of it is the question that I think is the layer deeper and, and maybe the more anxious question, which is rooted in the fact that God made us to work. We're made to work the garden. We're made to work in creation. We're, and work is a source of meaning and purpose. And I think a certain amount of anxiety comes with this idea that AI exists or AI is going to transform the workplace, transform work to where I exist only as a cog in a machine, an operator of a machine. I just have to get the inputs, the prompts, right? Which is, we already have a language for it. I'm just a prompter for the AI who actually does all the meaningful work of searching and assembling and all the rest of it. So I I wonder if you could even think about that. I'd I'd be interested in your take on this as well, Nicole. Like, How do we think about the way that AI might shift work in terms of how work provides a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning? My first thought is at least from what I've read so far, those who are using AI in work are using it to become more efficient, more effective at work. So going back to the Barner research on pastors, when a pastor realizes I can use AI to go through my sermon and create an outline, that presumably frees me up to do more of the things I love, to do more present care and pastoral care and to do more of the discipleship work. So I I do think... Part of the question is going to be, what are the spaces where AI can expand my capacity to work? And then what are the spaces that I feel are authentically owned by me being human? And I love the way that you framed that, Steve. There will be some things that only human beings can do. I think the fear is, what if what I think only a human being can do is not the same as what my boss thinks or as what the world thinks? But in most ways, shouldn't it be that AI helps to expand our capacity, give us more time and not hindering the time that we have? That would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. And from an anxiety point of view, it is true that there are some people accurately that don't have much agency over their life. But most of us actually have much more agency over our work choices than anxiety is telling us. So whether it's AI or a rough boss, like I spend a lot of time helping people figure out if they should leave a job and just giving them the freedom to explore it, look into options and figure that out. Just that freedom frees them and they can then approach that job feeling less stuck That's how I feel about AI. If you're genuinely worried that AI is going to take your job or it's going to make you feel less human, AI is going to be producing, you won't be producing. The best pathway is to just set a meeting with your employer and ask them and get clarity because anxiety is always telling you doom is about to happen. Financial security is a real thing. That's a real genuine, that's not a false sense of anxiety. That's a real sense. That's why I'm always prescribing action for people. So talking to the boss, looking at other options, going back to your childhood love, figuring out what you love to do, it's hard for me to see that humans will suddenly not be productive and not make a difference in the world. Stephen, in your work, you talk a lot about reactivity, and I I wonder if that's a factor in this conversation as well when we think about, because the flip side, we're talking a lot about from, from the employee side. How do we manage our anxieties about what it's going to do to me, what it's going to do to my work, my performance, my ability to provide? The flip side of that is for leaders. And leaders are looking at their teams, the anxiety on their teams. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about reactivity and the role that might play in some of this. What a boss needs to do is believe that being well as a boss, managing your reactivity and being a well self is the best gift you have to offer your team. And then creating a culture where your team can be well. And what that looks like is that means your team have a right to come in and have a bad day, be overreactive, but giving people space to care for each other, that'll lower staff turnover, that'll increase productivity faster than any training I know. And so you're absolutely right, Mike, like the top leader understanding the power they have to be a well self in the workplace is 
colossal. Reactivity is the only form of anxiety that's contagious. That's why I'm fascinated by it. Reactivity is always based on something false, not something true. So losing your job is actually based on a real threat of security and scarcity. But thinking you're probably going to lose your job because of AI, now we're in the territory of an assumption. Mm -hmm. And so if leaders can understand how their own assumptions infect the well-being of their workers, oh, that's huge. Yeah. And I think even just the idea of leadership being take the initiative at any given opportunity, this opportunity when the marketplace is obviously full of anxiety, Mm -hmm. full of uncertainty around this What a gift for Christian leaders, whether they're in the church or in the marketplace or wherever, to take the initiative to say, hey, here are the implications for this. Here's why we're always going to need people. Here's why you always have value to get ahead of those fears and concerns. Because that sort of shuts down reactivity before it starts. Yeah. Yeah. And the leader can make two brave moves. They can actually invite people to share all their fears, not just the, the safe fears. And then the leader can manage their own defensiveness in the need to talk about it. Just let people share That'll help people feel better. And then, yeah, the second leader, the thing the leader can do is ask the, I think the bravest question for a leader to ask is, how do you experience me when I'm not well? And if people are courageous enough to tell you, that then gives you permission to gently say to them, here's how I experience you when you're not well. Yeah. And can we commit together to have these conversations once in a while? I know that's not yeah. directly related to AI, but to get to your yeah. point, it directly tackles whatever people are worried about and assuages them in pretty beautiful ways. All right, see, before we let you go, I just want to encourage people to check out the show, Being Human, just launched a couple months ago here at CT. But also, while we have you on the bulletin, I have to ask about something that I didn't know about you, but I discovered about you. I, l- I listened to an interview with you on a, on another podcast that was, it was a couple years old, I think. Tell me about hypnotizing chickens. <laughs> Yeah, this is a thing. I've hypnotized this makes me very chickens. Excited. This makes me very excited. Yeah, I've hypnotized chickens on every continent except Antarctica and Asia. And <laughs> Asia's coming. Asia is coming. If I ever get to Antarctica, I'm going to have to pack my own chicken. I just want to be clear. This, I, this is not a joke. No, this, this is, is a real thing. thing. Yeah, this, this is a real so thing. So for those who don't know what hypnotizing chickens is, can yeah. you tell us how one hypnotizes a chicken? Maybe you can't explain how to do it, but just what is it? What happens? It would be a great pleasure. Step number one, you have to catch a chicken. <laughs> Um, and you know, usually if you're in a a developing country or something, you want the kids to catch the chicken because I'm 52 years old. You don't want to see a middle-aged man running around trying to get, it's very undignifying, but get your kids to catch a chicken. And then simply, I mean, the simple idea is their brain is pretty small and pretty simple. You lay them on the ground and then you put their beak very gently on the ground. It is a gentle process. No chickens are harmed in the hypnotizing (coughs) of chickens. And then you simply draw a line on the dirt from their beak straight out. And they, they get cross-eyed as you go from their beak. And I'm sorry, I've, I know we're on audio here, but I have a, you guys can attest, I have a very large nose. So I've got a good beak here. Too. You and me both, brother. Yeah. So you just draw a line, usually with a stick, quite rapidly straight out from them. And they just stare at it. And they will lay there, just lay with their wings out as long as you want until you clap and wake them up and then they run away. It's an amazing party trip if you're ever on a global mission trip. Uh, I've hypnotized a turkey. I'm making my way up the bird chain (laughs) to emu, but uh, turkey is the biggest I've gone so far. That is one of the most fascinating facts ever. (laughs) Yeah. My kids are uh, third generation chicken hypnotists. All all three of my children can hypnotize. And they're Americans. So that's impressive. We've crossed generational and cultural divide. So yeah. things you didn't know, and I believe I, the, the, there are videos on YouTube. There it is. I just had to. I had to ask. Uh, with that, Steve Cuss, thanks for joining us. Check out Being Human wherever you get your podcasts, and we will see you right after this. Joining us for this next conversation is Robert Nicholson. Robert is the president and executive director of the Philos Project. He's also been a guest here before. Robert, welcome back to The Bulletin. So on Friday, Alexei Navalny, Russia's top opposition leader and Vladimir Putin's most vocal and active critic, died suddenly. He was serving 19 years in a special regime penal colony, which is another way of referring to a gulag. He was serving on a variety of charges, which his critics would say were trumped up against him because of his anti-corruption work. Reports from the prison say that he felt unwell during a walk and collapsed. Prison officials told his mothers he died from, quote, sudden death syndrome, 
which is a very Soviet area euphemism, like becoming a non-person. Navalny came to politics in 2004, beginning with a movement against overdevelopment in Moscow. In 2010, he founded an anti-corruption project, and really from 2011 onward, anti-corruption was his main platform across all of Russia and in front of the world. In 2013, he ran for the mayor of Moscow, and during that year, he was brought up on corruption charges that most independent observers agree were false accusations. He was convicted, sentenced to five years in prison, but released while awaiting an appeal, during which he continued to run in that election. Ultimately, he lost that election, but he continued his anti-corruption work. In 2016, he announced that he was running for president against Russian President Vladimir Putin. A few months later, in 2017, he was attacked with a green disinfectant, permanently damaging his right eye. In 2020, he was poisoned, most likely with some kind of nerve agent, and he ended up in a German hospital for months recovering and barely survived the ordeal. He then shocked many people by returning to Russia once he did recover, at which point he was sent to prison again and ultimately to this gulag. He would later be sentenced to 19 years, and he knew and his supporters knew that he was never going to leave that prison. Either his sentence would be extended or he would die there. In the years that followed, he continued his anti-corruption work, continued to fight charges of corruption from the regime. From prison, he was accused of everything from embezzlement to terrorism to vandalism, a remarkable achievement for someone behind bars. Then in 2023, an Oscar-winning documentary about his life was released called Navalny. As that was being celebrated, Russian doctors were appealing to the Russian government on his behalf, believing that he was being denied basic medical care while behind bars. He died on Friday. He was 47 years old. It's a tragic story. It's a familiar story. Joining us to talk about it is Robert Nicholson from the executive director and president of the Philos Project. Robert's been on the show before. Robert, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be here. Robert, I wonder if you could help us a bit just to start this conversation to talk a little bit about what a figure like Navalny means in political life in Russia and in terms of the way the world has looked at Russia over the last 10, 15 years. He was really an extraordinary figure. And I think your timeline, which could be extended even further back and filled in along the way, really shows what this one person did to illustrate the potential of a better Russia, right? When the fall of the Soviet Union happened, when the 1990s began with Russia wanting to open up to the world, wanting to bring in what we'd call liberal values, there was tremendous enthusiasm for what could be. Unfortunately, all of that was subsequently derailed largely by the current president, Vladimir Putin. And what you have now is a gangster regime, right? It's not that corruption is a problem in the state. Corruption is at the core of what this state is. And Navalny, because of his own experiences, his father being a Soviet military officer, his family hailing from the area around Chernobyl, grew up with an eye toward the flaws in first the Soviet regime and then the Russian regime that followed. And I think what's most extraordinary about him is his courage. Why, after being poisoned by Russia, would one get on a plane and fly to Moscow? After all of the things that you said had happened, go even further, double down and try to make a difference. So I think in terms of the promise of a better Russia, both in the eyes of Russians and for those of us on the outside, Navalny really embodied what could be, right? This idea of rule of law, this idea of fighting corruption, opening things up, making sure that this massive state is not run by one guy and that it could actually be part of the community of nations. That's to me what he represented. And with his removal, which has foul play written all over it, uh, I think everyone's left asking, okay, so what about that promise? Is there any future for the Russian opposition? Is there any way of stopping this guy, Vladimir Putin, or are we just here for the ride? I think that last question is the part that is most concerning. If Navalny represented, and his wife, by the way, who, when she first began to speak out, there was an assumption that maybe she's taking up his charge. But as you look even at her timeline, she's also been along this pathway of activism as well. But the angst becomes, 
if that can happen to him, what hope is there for another view? So what does it look like for Americans to sympathize, to support, to advocate for justice in this particular instance, or to support and advocate for a better Russia? So the future of the Russian opposition at this point left on its own is, at least for the foreseeable future, pretty bleak. There is a think tank that has estimated the percentage of the Russian population that is essentially in opposition is something like 15%. So you're talking about a smaller group of people to begin with. Now with the removal of one of their main figureheads and this feeling, as you said, Nicole, of if it can happen to him, it's going to happen to all of us. I think there's a real chilling effect on whatever is left. The real question is the one that you asked, which is what can those of us on the outside do to assist them? And I think you got to think about that really in two ways. The first one is, you could say, at the realm of the spirit, right, at the level of the people. And we have a model, right? You go back to the Refusenik movement, what was happening under the Soviet Union when it was very similar to what we're seeing today. And I think the odds back then seemed even more impossible than they do now of people within the regime under Soviet rule, dissenting, coming out, right? You think of people like Natan Sharansky, who became very famous for being one of these refuseniks. And there was a groundswell among the American people. Think of it as kind of people-to-people work for elevating the plight of these people, supporting these people. And of course, the church played a big role in that, the church writ large. And I think that it's almost hard to imagine that now, what is it, 40, 50 years later, We're so far from that moment of internal solidarity as Americans around a set of moral principles and what our role is in the world, that it's almost hard to imagine from which quarter here in the U.S. that kind of groundswell could even come, right? You have people on the right and the left who are both like, forget it. It's got nothing to do with this. But I think the second thing is, and this is really key, in addition to that civil society response, which needs to be smart, strategic, and all of that, there still needs to be a state response, right? Pressure needs to be applied from outside on Vladimir Putin if this is something that we want to see, right? Vladimir Putin, like all autocrats, will continue to push until he can't push anymore. There's an old saying attributed to Stalin, something to the effect of probe with bayonets. If you hit mush, push. If you hit steel, withdraw. And that is the attitude of not just Putin, but people like him. They will keep going until they feel pressure. And what that means for U.S. foreign policy, what it means for the war in Ukraine, you you have to do all these calculations. But this Vladimir Putin will run roughshod over any opposition until he is feeling the heat from other quarters. I worry that, as I just said, the internal climate, the domestic climate here in the U.S., is not exactly ripe for that kind of robust engagement, which right. is concerning. There was Pew data that came out that was a national poll that showed a surprisingly large constituency of Americans on both sides of the aisle, supportive of the war in Ukraine and supportive of Israel, the war in Gaza, in spite of how loud opposition to both of those things are at either end of the poll, there is still this sense, I think largely among Americans, that that America is supposed to be a force for good in the world and that we should be supporting causes to that end, whether that's the end of Hamas or the undermining of a regime like Putin in this effort to swallow up Ukraine. And yet the problem is, at the same time, like the problem is those voices are so loud and they are so amplified So one of the ironies, unfortunate ironies of Navalny's death is that it comes about a week after Tucker Carlson, one of the most prominent Mm -hmm. media figures on the right, does this Walter Durante trip to Moscow where he goes around and first of all, he gives Putin a very uncritical interview and gives him a microphone to spew ahistoric lies about the nature of the war and the purpose of the war. He also then goes... Like so many during the Cold War, they'd go to the subway station and they'd say, look how beautiful the streets are and look how beautiful the infrastructure is and all the rest of it. And look how cheap the grocery store is. The dollar's worth 50 rubles or whatever it is here. And the ignorance of this is just mind blowing. I think the statistics are that like two in five Russians use latrines. Like this is a culture where the poverty is so deep. People are used to food in buckets 
And we're treating it as though it's some kind of elevated society because he found a cheap grocery store and because the subways were clean. It's easy to keep the subways clean when you're in authoritarian culture and you can literally beat people and throw them in a, in a gulag for littering. And then the especially repulsive comments that he made afterwards when he essentially said, yeah, dictators kill people. Everybody kills people. And those comments were just sort of embraced and brushed off. It's really unfortunate. And I just struggle as a person who generally is a conservative, right? I struggle to figure out how do you break through the noise of that way of looking at the world, that way of telling a story about who Putin is and what this regime is. And Navalny is the kind of character who could potentially break through in that way because he reminds me of other dissident figures who had that way with words, that courage, that eloquence to cut through. Alexander Solzhenitsyn converted to orthodoxy in prison. There's interesting parallels there. And when Solzhenitsyn won his Nobel Prize, he gave that famous beauty will change the world speech. He was quoting Dostoevsky. But what he was getting at was this idea that telling those stories truthfully, in a gritty way, in a way that literature could, in a way that you could only portray through sort of the way that humanity is exposed through great literature. And I think there's something similar to the way a figure like Navalny or, or the films that have been made about him or the storytelling that's going to follow in his death, that stuff breaks through even the bubble of an autocratic totalitarian mm -hmm. regime like this. And you have to hope that happens for the Russians. If you want to believe that Putin is somehow this great defender of the Christian West, you can, and you'll get applauded for it. Sorry, that was just a rant, but it's a deeply disturbing aspect of all of this, is how far down that rabbit hole we've gone. Yeah, I think you're right to uh, isolate the stories, right? Navalny's ability to tell a tale and the inability, I think, of most of our leaders right now to tell a tale that's compelling enough to spur the kind of action we want. Three things came together, in my opinion, to defeat the Soviet Union. It was liberalism, right, and lowercase liberalism, capitalism, and Christianity, right? And that's a piece of the story a lot of people don't remember. It was the election of the first Polish pope. It was the way in which that inspired grassroots movement, the solidarity movement in Poland, and a whole number of things in which Reagan was drawn in and evangelicals played a role. We have the first two, essentially, right? The liberal rules-based international order, trademark, and we have capitalism, certainly. But what's missing is the Christian piece. And if you have the Christian piece, you mentioned Dostoevsky, you are able to draw upon the Russian imagination in a way that people like Dostoevsky did. There's one of my favorite thinkers is this Lebanese Christian philosopher, statesman, Charles Malik. And he talked about this a lot in the midst of the Cold War. This is a Cold War warrior par excellence at the UN in his native Lebanon as ambassador here in the United States. And his big challenge of life was confronting the Soviet Union. One of the things that he said as an Orthodox Christian was that we have all the raw materials here within Russian culture, which is historically a very Christian culture, to tell a better story about the Russian people and its possibilities that links them to Christians of different kinds in the West. The problem is you have on one hand in the United States, people telling a very national story, who cares about anything beyond the beach? And then you have people on the very, very extreme on the other side telling this globalist sort of universal story in which people are fungible, cultures are fungible, and nothing really means anything at all. We need a civilizational story, if I can put it that way, that I think encompasses Russia's place in the traditional Christian world and that acknowledges its contributions over the years. But I just don't know if people are, are really thinking that. I think it's there. And Mike, you're saying something really important. The vast majority of people, thank, thank goodness for Joe Q. Public, right? He's just, he's dependable. He gets it. It's from the gut. He can't really articulate it, but he's, oh, no, Putin's bad. That person, just like that, his counterpart in Russia, would understand that kind of story if only leaders inside the church, outside the church, in the state, outside the state, were telling them it, Right. I also wonder, it hits at this point of the larger narrative. What is the narrative of Christian faith 
today in America, which is a little bit scary. And then how are we passing that narrative on in a way that makes people feel a collective solidarity with those who are fighting for their faith in other parts of the world, and also gives us a sense of empowerment that because of my faith, I have a right to speak up for what is wrong. How do we reconcile that in light of some other alliances, like with what's happening with Russia and North Korea? We see, and part of my question is actually a, what's almost a statement, but when the news came out that Putin gave Kim Jong-un a limousine, I laughed And then I caught myself at how callous I've become Mm. to these extreme dictators Mm. joining forces in a way that can threaten the rest of society. And I had to pause and think, why am I chuckling at that? Mm. It's just, I think it's, we've gotten to the point of such absurdity that there is no unifying anger. There is no unifying, I can't, do not, you're not allowed to cross this barrier. And when the line is drawn, it's so perceived as political that there's no Christian unity in that way. How do we keep from becoming so callous so that we really can be a part of a global narrative that causes us to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice? Wow. Those are big questions. I think about them often. I'll, I'll hazard an answer. It's imperfect, but I do think one of the things that is important for Christians in particular to keep in mind is that the worldview that comes out of Scripture is marked, in my opinion, by a kind of duality, right? You think about Daniel in exile, right, which is not unlike our situation as Christians in a fallen world. He is able both on one hand every day, three times a day, open his window and pray toward Jerusalem for Israel's redemption, and at the same time seek the good of the city, as Jeremiah commanded him, and all of the exiles, working not only under this imperial government, but working in the superstructure, right, at a very high level. And I think that Christians who embrace solely a national narrative or solely a globalist narrative need to understand that you could, there, there is a way the biblical tradition provides a way to both be a strong believer, supporter, participant in the American story, care about our national interests, right? Seek the good of this city while also on the other side of our brain, right? We should understand this. We do this all the time. Every Sunday morning, we're in a different kingdom, right? Every every Sunday morning at church, we are participating in this alternative society. So this shouldn't be hard, but to say that At the same time, we are pursuing this kind of civilizational story that's a moral story, that's a a Christian story, right? That we believe the kingdom of God is growing, the church is expanding, that there are stands that we have to take in addition to the baseline of patriotic duties that speak to brothers and sisters being persecuted in a place like Russia or Iran or China or Africa, anywhere. And to take action, right? Not just to pray, but to do and to begin to collaborate across those lines. Absolutely. I appreciate your perspective and given the work that you have done in so many different countries and some very conflict-ridden situations, I appreciate the way that you are able to balance that duality of being in a national context and yet a part of a larger global story. So thank you for sharing with us today. We appreciate you and we'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Esau McCauley, who is an author and associate professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. He's the author of many books, including his new memoir, How Far to the Promised Land, and a children's book entitled Josie Johnson's Hair and the Holy Spirit. Esau is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. His writings have also been featured in places like The Atlantic, Washington Post, and Christianity Today. I'm especially thrilled, Esau, because it's been too long since we've connected. Connected. Yes. But thank you for coming on the show on your sabbatical. Yes, it's sad when you have to use podcasts to catch my friends. The, the reason <laughs> exactly. why I'm here is because I said, oh, Nicole's doing a podcast. I'll come and talk to Nicole. So that I don't means- even know what I don't even know what we're talking about, but I'm going to say, how you doing? How the family? 
That is exactly right. That is how this works. Today, we're going to be talking about why Black History Month still matters. And yes. believe it or not, I have had someone ask me that question. Do yeah. we still celebrate Black History Month? Yeah. So from your vantage point, why does Black History Month still matter? I always like to talk about the two narratives of American history that we like to tell ourselves. And one of those narratives we have to tell ourselves is that things really weren't so bad in America. We had slavery and, and all of those things. We overcame slavery. We had the civil rights movement. And now we're this perfect, wonderful society. And so in that story, the main focus is on the inevitable American ascent towards utopia. And in that narrative, African-Americans play a particular role. We are a flaw that America overcomes on its path to greatness. And the center of that narrative is like American compassion and goodness, which means there's an injustice now. Wait, because eventually we'll figure it out. One of the things, and maybe I would say the central element of that narrative is the inability to look really into the brokenness of what this country once was. And I think there's another narrative that tells the story of America from the underside. That means that we both look deeply into what this country has done wrong and we found some hope nonetheless. In other words, I would say African-American account of history is a history that is not rooted in nostalgia or myth-making, but it sees the thing itself and it finds beauty in it. And in that place, what it does is it puts the characters back in the story in the way that they actually belong. Because it happens that a lot of times, key the key contributions of African-Americans and the things we've done to make this country what it was is often erased. And so one of the wonderful things about African-American history is that it challenges American myth-making and it corrects a distorted record. And it, it forces us to reckon with a complicated beauty. One of the amazing things about the Old Testament and even the New Testament is that it seems like God was very comfortable inspiring writers to tell about the broken parts. And he imagined that the people of Israel were able to understand that part of their history was the golden calf. Part of the history was the various kings who apostatized and all of the wickedness and the mayhem that was done by even leaders in the nation and then later in the church. And those texts aren't exemplars showing us what to do. They show us what not to do. And even Paul said that those things in the past were written for our instruction. And through the recounting of Israel's history, the people of God were meant to learn, we don't want to go back to that. Now, America is in Israel, but the thematic lesson remains. The reason that we must consistently return to the past is so that we never forget what we're capable of, so that we're constantly pushing forward to a better future. Because what really happens now is that when there are present moments of injustice that we're battling against, one of the ways that that injustice is resisted is by once again revising history. And so I think that African-American history allows us to see America as what it actually has been, but also to inspire us to be better than what we currently are. And how do we as Christians reconcile the tension that I think is also a political tension yeah. that says we've always been great. <laughs> Let's just keep that greatness. And if those people were enslaved, they made us better. Why yeah. talk about it? Yeah, like we overcame slavery. Look at us. We're so great. I think that the main, it's, you're gonna, you have a theologian. And so sometimes people get mad at us Bible people because we keep giving Bible answers to problems. Yes. Yes. Because I know there's economic and social and political stuff, but like you, you got a New Testament scholar and a theologian. I think if we actually understood and applied what Christianity teaches about the person, we'd, we'd have a better understanding of our country. In other words, Christianity says that every human being is made in the image of God. That means we're capable of doing profound, creative, wonderful things that defy human imagination. But we're also broken. And so we're all capable of real darkness and evil. And that even th these two realities, made in the image of God, fallenness, and then you add the other one, we, those who are Christians are redeemed, but that redemption is not complete, and we can consistently fall back into sin. So if that is true about the human person, that we made in the image of God, that we're fallen, that many of us are Christians, but that Christianity has not had its full effect, then you would expect to see some kind of mix of the possibility of good, real evil, and Christians falling short of the glory of God. 
Then what do you see when you open the pages of American history? Elements of real heroicism and real beauty and real goodness, but also profound evil and Christians whose Christianity has not actually borne fruit in their lives. And to assume that if America, which is a collection of individuals, won't show the marks of our fallenness in the history of our country is a flawed anthropology. In other words, we have an account of American history that in effect de denies original sin. Like how can you have how can you have a nation full of sinners and not have a bunch of sin? <laughs> and and there are times, and there are, and this is what I say the nation of Israel is so instructive. There are times where it seems like the darkness is going to swallow the nation whole. America isn't the church, right? But given the, the, the significant amount of Christians who, who are involved in this, then that pattern in history of nations falling short of the glory of God, raising up people to call that fallenness out. In other words, here's the thing. And this is the question you might want to ask yourself. Is America great? This, this, you don't want to do a binary. Is America great because Abraham Lincoln existed here or because of Frederick Douglass existed here? And this isn't a binary, right? In other words, there is no, there, there, you can't tell the story of America without someone like Frederick Douglass and the particular role that Frederick Douglass played in the abolitionist movement and the particular resistance and, and, and the halting movement towards liberation that Abraham Lincoln did kicking and screaming. The Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves that were in rebellion in the South. They didn't free all of the slaves. And we know that he resisted issuing the emancipation for a long period of time. And we know that from the beginning, Frederick Douglass and others were saying this war is to end slavery. And it was part of the push of the abolitionist that led to the emancipation of African-Americans and not simply the Frederick Douglass stuff. I think it's like a sermon on Thanksgiving. I think it's by Richard Allen on the occasion of the freeing of the slaves in D.C. I think that's the sermon. And he's giving thanks for the liberation of the slaves. But he says explicitly it was not Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves. It was God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had freed slaves in the past and who has done so again. So you see, if you, if, in other words, if you open up the pages of African-American history, you're not simply going to get indictment after indictment. You're going to get the praise of God for it working out his glory or his purposes in human history. You're also going to see a real honest critique of American in, act, in action, but also the possibility of hope. And so to me, I don't think there's any other way to tell the American story. What I like to say is that a lie can only be kept in place by violence. I remember an experience that I had at a place I used to serve, and there was a group of people who felt very bothered that we were planning some ways to celebrate and honor Black History Month. Yeah. So on the one side, the argument was, Black History Month, at the time that it was started in 1926, was Black History Week. We have yeah. arrived. We have come through civil rights. You, Nicole, are in a yeah. great place in life and society. Why do we need to celebrate that anymore? And then on the other side, there was a sense, if we're going to celebrate Black History Month, then every single month has to have a way to celebrate the stories of the oppressed. Because if you only leave our brokenness to what happened with slavery, then you miss out on covering the full gamut of all who yeah. are oppressed. What do you say to those types of feelings or those statements? The interesting thing as it relates to justice is that the statements around justice are never actually measured by the reality of equality, but distance traveled. In other words, if you start with slavery and you say, look, and, and if you can go back and read it, if you look in the 1950s and the 1960s, they, would, they were saying, hey, this isn't as bad as Reconstruction. You all should stop complaining. Or the end of Reconstruction. You go to the end of Reconstruction, you say, Reconstruction is bad. End of Reconstruction, Jim Crow is black, but slavery is worse. In other words, historically, people look towards the previous generation and say to African Americans, it's not as bad as what it used to be. You should be satisfied. But the question is never justice itself. In other words, the standard is not distance from slavery because slavery was really bad. The standard is actual justice. And so if you start with black inferiority, then yes, it's possible to measure progress. It would be crazy if there's been no progress in America. But that ain't the standard, because we should have been in slavery in the first place. The standard is justice. The second thing I want to say is that the idea that the arrival in a place eliminates the need to remember 
is a illogical argument. In other words, we don't do that in any other arena of life. Paul even says this. Paul says, when he talks about their Christian faith, these are things that you used to do, things of which you are now ashamed. In other words, he doesn't say, I condemn you for your past. He is saying, you remember what that was like? You don't want to return there. How many times have you been on the verge? Not you. I know you super saved, but the people who are listening. How many times have we been on the verge of doing something we ain't got no business doing? He said, man, I remember the last time I did that. And I remember how I felt about it. I'm not going to return to it. So to remember something is not to remember it for the sake of condemnation. It's to remember it for the sake of continued transformation. We have this strange evolutionary doctrine of, of moral development. And what I mean by that is children are not, are not born with the fruits of the moral decisions made in the past. Like every generation resets. The idea that you overcame racism and now that's just downloaded into your kid's DNA is not true. Every generation needs to remember afresh its past so they can strain towards the future. And so I don't think that there is any danger or any reason to avoid American. The real question is, when you talk about like my family never owned slaves, that's probably true. It's the majority of families probably didn't. But the social benefit that comes from having an underclass is not limited to the owning of slaves. If you had no other money, if you were nothing but like a poor white tenant farmer, you could say at least I'm not a black tenant farmer. And the black tenant farmer had to tip their hat when you walked the down the road, they had to cross the street, they had to eat in different places. In other words, there was a social and emotional hierarchy, a benefit accrued to you simply by not being black. One of the things that I, that I tried to do, you asked me about, about the book, How Far to the Promised Land. What I was trying to do through the course of telling my family story over generations was to show that this idea that we can avoid or escape American history is a luxury. Because when you're poor, black, and Southern, all of American history kind of is dumped on your back. It's one thing to say, I don't want to hear about Jim Crow. But my great-grandmother was a tenant farmer who picked cotton and who cleaned people's houses and who was a midwife. And under Jim Crow, this when I'm saying under Jim Crow, my great-grandmother bought, I talk about this in the book, she bought a plot of land. That plot of land that she bought under Jim Crow was the land that I spent the first few years of my life on. And it was also the land, because it was under Jim Crow, for a variety of reasons, the contract that she signed, because these are illiterate black women who weren't educated because because of, according to the Jim Crow laws, it wasn't worth it to educate black women. That land was eventually stolen from my family. Hood land that I grew up on, that my grandmother worked hard to purchase under Jim Crow, was stolen from us by structural racism in the early 2000s. My grandfather was not allowed to go to integrated schools because of the Jim Crow laws that existed in the time. And we all know that the economic future, the biggest predictor of college education is the education of one's parents. So if my grandparents were not allowed into college, then that had an impact on my, my mother's education, which then had an impact on me. And so this idea that, that American history is past is something that I think is a myth. And it's one of the themes that I explore in my book, the ways in which the, the tentacles of racism stretches out over a family's history. Now, this gets to the complexity of the American story. The totality of my family's story is not that racism is bad and the bad things happen to us. We're not just acted upon. We were actors. And sometimes people in my family make decisions of their own that also has an implication for what our family is and what our family becomes. And so that mix of human responsibility, right, and the structural things that get in our way, it, somewhere in that mix, all of us are trying to make our way uh, towards a, a better life for ourselves here and hopefully in the coming kingdom. How do you stay hopeful? <laughs> what keeps you from being angry and despondent and upset? <laughs> Man, I have good friends. I'll say two things. One is I just imagine people who I've met along the way who are doing good work, which I'm unaware. This might seem like I'm being nice to you, Nicole. But I said, every time I said, I'm not going to Nicole. She's somewhere <laughs> doing something good. So I can just sit down somewhere. And there's just people who you meet 
And they just become these little beacons of light. And every now and then you see them like, oh, look at Lisa Fields doing great stuff. Look at my buddy Justin Gibney doing good stuff. Look at Charlie Day's preaching over there in Chicago. Look at Ben Watson running around the country doing stuff. And I'm just like, oh, Christina Edmondson, Natasha Six Church Robinson, Kimmy Uwan, all of these people. And so when I see them just living as Christians, that's the cloud of witnesses the Bible talks about. That encourages me. The other one is, it's a theological belief. And I actually believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. And if you root your hope at any moment in American history, that is an unstable foundation. I think it was a Dred Scott decision. And they said, there is no law as it relates to a black man that a white man is bound to obey. And that signal, it seemed like the end of the abolitionist movement. And it had made the fugitive slave law, the law of the land. You can hunt down black people anywhere and take them back to the South. And I imagine, what was it like to be an abolitionist in that moment? Where you had fought and fought, and you get a Supreme Court decision saying black people have no rights. And it was a civil war that would intervene. But within 10 years from that statement, black people have zero rights. Within 10 years, the emancipate the 13th Amendment, the Civil War will end in the freeing of the slaves. And nobody could have predicted that turn of events. But I think that what the Christian abolitionists had at heart was a belief in the truth of the thing itself. And that God providentially works himself out in history. And so they looked at the circumstances. Man, there's nothing to do. We just lost. We lost the Supreme Court. We went all the way to the top. We got beat. Let's just quit. But they kept going because there was nothing left to do but to do the right thing. And, or even you look after various moments in, in civil rights movement where it looks like things are lost. I think there are numerous times where all around us feels dark and all that we can turn to is the light of the world. And right now, I think we're in one of these moments. I don't see, I'll be honest, I don't want to mess with the bulletin, but I feel like 2024 20, is going to be a rough one. We all mess <laughs> with the bulletin. That's why we're here. <laughs> I feel like 2024 is going to be a wild year. And I don't see how any of this stuff isn't going to be complicated in the next election year. But I feel like even though I can't see a path through that doesn't involve real difficulties to the people of God, I believe that God's going to be faithful because he has in the past. Amen. Esau, thank you for having this time with us. I'm encouraging our listeners to read your book, How Far to the Promised Land, which is out wherever you buy books. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate you and the work that you're doing. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Yes. Thank you, listeners. We will see you next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. It's produced by Clarissa Mall and Matt Stevens. Post-production by TJ Hester. Our art for this episode is by Rick Shooks. Music by Dan Phelps. And social media by Kate Lucky. Thanks for listening.